Well, what is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. We are excited to have you in church today. Man, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're a visitor, I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and today, today is extra fun. I'll, I'll tell you what, we've, we've got so many wonderful people on staff, and I want to introduce one of you, one of those guys that is just on our staff rocking it. You already know who he is, especially those of you in downtown, those of our interns. Come on, Drew, come on up here. Many of you guys know, come on, Pastor Drew Shap. Yeah. The, the, there we go, helping me out. I'm on my tiptoes right now, just trying to, no, actually, this is my normal height right here. No, no, for real. Actually, I love Drew. Many of you guys know him as our campus pastor in downtown, but he's also our intern director and really just all around great guy. He's also the keeper of beards and uh, other things. And, you know, you never know when that might, that might leave, right? I mean, is that forever? It's forever. All right. See, there you go. You heard it, Erica Shep, wherever you're at. Uh, anyway, no. Uh, anyway, we're, we're so pumped. And I, I asked Drew if he would just come bring the heat today. And so would you guys give a warm substance welcome to our very own Pastor Drew Shep. Thanks, Pastor Peter. Awesome being with you guys. Love you, Substance. Uh, last time I was with you, I actually told you about my wife. At that time, she was 40 weeks and one day pregnant. I'm happy to announce today she is no longer pregnant, because that was about three months ago. Uh, so we did give birth, she gave birth actually, to a little girl, beautiful little girl named Athalia Jubilee. Athalia means the Lord God is exalted. We are just head over heels in love once again. It's great having a baby in the house again. We're, just, we're having a great time. Um, also, the last couple months, my wife and I, Erica, we celebrated our nine-year anniversary. So we've been married for nine years now. Super fun. I know many of you in our church have been married for longer and shorter, but man, every anniversary is a milestone to celebrate. Come on, right? So um, I, in that spirit, I thought I'd share a little bit with you about kind of an insight into my marriage, right? So a little bit, some things about Erica, my wife and I. Um, we are so stinking different, like, I mean, it's crazy, you guys. So can I help frame this up? She is an ESTJ, and I am an INFJ. Now, if you have no idea what that means, let me translate for you. It means good luck, okay? But seriously, if you've never taken Myers-Briggs before, it's kind of a personality indicator. I would really recommend taking it. Um, and it's, it's so good to be self-aware of who you are, how God has wired you as a person, and how, that you, how then you relate to other people, especially your spouse, right? So um, let me unpack that a little bit, what that means for you. So my wife... She's an E, which means she is a huge extrovert, right? She's a, an extraordinarily extroverted person. She gets energy by being around people. They give her life. I, on the other hand, I am a raging introvert, right? I'm constantly one step away from relocating to a solitary cave for the rest of my life. Um, I love people. I really, I love the job I get to do here at Substance, but people just drain me. That's just kind of the personality God has given me. Uh, you may be asking yourself, okay, you're an introvert, yet you're standing in front of all these people talking. How does that work? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because I'm talking and you're not. Um, that's how that works. So um, moving on. When I say that my wife is an S, means what she's, called, she's what's called sensing. This means that she sees, sees things in black and in white. She wants to know the facts, right? She takes things in based on what she sees. She asks questions like, what is practical? What is logical? What is realistic? I, on the other hand, I'm intuitive. I live life in the gray. I think about what's possible. I'm an idealist, right? Actually, I kind of refer to it, my wife as my cute little dream crusher which is a real thing. Um, but sometimes my dreams need to be crushed. Let's throw that out there. So uh, let's move on again. So my wife has a preference for tea, which means she's a thinker, right? Um, when she makes decisions, she does so in a rational, impartial, logical way. She bases her actions on what is fair and what is right. Me, I'm a feeler, which means that I feel all the feels all the time, right? So I make decisions based on well, how's this going to affect other people, right? I'm constantly asking, well, how does my decision affect this person and that person? So my wife, often the conversation we'll have is she'll say, why can't you just make a decision? And I'll say, why don't you have feelings? <laughs> okay, my wife has feelings, okay, but you get what I'm saying. You get where I'm going. So it doesn't stop there, okay? So personality differences. Um, I grew up in a super small family. So literally, I have one brother, um, a mom and dad. My dad was an only child. My mom has one sister with one daughter. I have one cousin. Super small family, right? My wife is one of six kids. Um, she has um, she with eight aunts and uncles. If you combine the spouses, that's 16 aunts and uncles. Um, roughly 11 billion cousins, um, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, her family is super duper loud. My family is super quiet and serene. Um, I can tend towards being a little bit passive-aggressive at times. My wife, if you know her, she's just aggressive-aggressive um, a lot of the time. 
Um, and then perhaps the single biggest point of tension in our nine years of marriage happened uh, just about two years ago. I don't know if you're anything like my wife and I, we have our shows on Netflix right now. We're currently watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., kind of a fun way to, for us to connect. Uh, two years ago, we sat down to watch our show. I said, okay, you ready to watch? And she gave me this look. I was like, what's going on? It comes to light that my wife, my dear beloved bride, Erica, watched two entire seasons of our Netflix show without me. Two entire seasons. Unbelievable. But I'm over it. It's fine. I'm totally, totally over it, even though I bring it up almost every week. Now, why am I telling you this, right? Like, why? I promise there's a lot more to this than talking about our personalities or the great Netflix portrayal of 2014, okay? There's a, there's a reason behind this, right? Um, this isn't a big group therapy session, although I do feel a whole lot better after getting this off my chest in front of all you people. Um, there's a purpose, and the purpose is this. I want to talk to you today about tension. Tension. Now, I've never really met anyone in my life who actually enjoys tension. By its very definition, tension is something that implies stretching and straining and even breaking and pain. Yet, I believe it is something fundamental to the human experience. Now, I just described some of the marital tension that Eric and I feel on a day-to-day -day basis, something that we, things that we walk through. The truth is that we all encounter varying degrees of tension each and every day in our marriages, our parenting, our relationships, our friends, our workplaces, in our church, in our universities, everywhere we go, tension is fundamental to the human experience. Now, we each face individual unique tensions on a day-to-day -day basis, reflective of our season of life, right? Our circumstances, our personality styles. However, any one of us can create a similar list. Tension in this fallen world is inescapable. So the question we have to reckon with is not one of if, but how. It's not about if we'll face tension, if we'll walk through it, how will we live our lives in light of the tension that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the good news is that the Bible is not silent on this. It actually has a lot to say about seasons of tension and trial and pain. It's full of men and women of God walking through seasons of difficulty and seasons of victory, experiencing humble defeats, right, and all of the above. So today, we're going to look at what I believe is actually one of the most tension-filled points in human history, the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you'll know that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, kind of tell the narrative of the life of Christ, right? And each Gospel is written from a different viewpoint of one of the disciples. Each is different in terms of tone and style, and actually each one contains kind of a different version of the narrative of Jesus' life. Now, there's different stories you find in one version of the gospel you won't find in other gospels, but there's actually 11 stories that find, you can find in every single gospel all the way through, and the Garden of Gethsemane is one of those. And I believe we should pay special attention to those stories, the stories that we see over and over again repeated in the gospel. So, for the next several moments, um, I want to kind of unpack this story um, using the book of Matthew in chapter 27. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull three things out of this story of Jesus in the Garden to teach us how we walk through tension. We're going to learn first to look for tension. We're going to learn second to lean into tension. And third, we're going to learn how to love through tension. So we're going to learn to look, lean, and love. Before we do that, a little bit of context for where we find ourselves, right? So um, Jesus, at this point that we're going to read in Matthew 27, is roughly 33 years old. So for the first 30 years of his life, he lived in relative obscurity. He was a carpenter under Joseph. And we really don't know much about those early years. But at the age of 30, we see Jesus coming into full-time ministry. He enters in. He's baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And he inaugurates the kingdom of God on earth with miracles and deliverances and all kinds of other things that he does. It's a really wonderful place to read in the Bible. And along the way, Jesus chose, chose 12 young men to kind of be his inner core, his disciples, his leadership team. Out of those 12, there's actually three, Peter, James, and John, who are kind of his inner circle of leadership, his, kind of his best friends. So Jesus goes through three years of public ministry, in the process becoming public enemy number one of the religious leaders of the day, right? And ultimately, he's such a pain in their necks, they decide that they're going to kill him, murder him, and they're going to use one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, to do that. So here's Jesus, right? 33 years old. Um, he and his disciples have just eaten together. They've been through three years of ministry together, kind of walked the road of ministry, the tensions and trials of life. They've just had their last meal, what we know now as the Last Supper. They've e eaten together, um, and Jesus knows that his time is short. Judas has already left to go betray him. The Roman guard is on their way to his location, um, and they walk into this garden. Jesus knows that he's about to be arrested, tortured, and ultimately killed on a cross. It doesn't get a whole lot more tense for a man than that. And that's where we pick up 
in Matthew, right? Reading in Matthew 26, 36, sorry, 36, or 27, 26. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. You can almost feel the tension of this moment, right? Jesus pleading with his closest friends, please stay here, be with me, watch with me, look with me. He then leaves and goes a little farther and he prays, right? We'll come back to that prayer in a moment here. But going on to verse 40, here's what he says. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you cannot watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, the second time, he went away and prayed. And again, he came back and found them sleeping again. So he leaves them again for a third time. He goes and prays and again comes back. And they're sleeping. And this time he says, right, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now as I've read and studied and reflected on this passage and prayed through it, three words have stuck out to me have kind of stayed with me and almost haunted me these past several weeks. These three words are this, watch and pray. Watch and pray. The first thing we do in light of our tension is we have to look for it. This is a warning for his disciples, right? It's a warning for us. Watch and pray. Be alert. Stay awake. See. Look. And as we read this, it's easy for us to look at these disciples and say, how did they miss it? Right? Like, how could they possibly fall asleep? Of all moments to fall asleep, this one? Really? I mean, Jesus literally just begged them to stay awake and watch with him. And not only that, if you look a few verses farther back, Jesus actually already told them, all of you will fall away from me because of this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He actually said that a few hours ago. It couldn't be any more clear and somehow they missed it. Again, not only that, but if you go back even farther, a review of Jesus' life, you see that amidst the stories of miracles and feeding the people and healing and deliverance, he was actually constantly getting them ready for this moment. Look back at Matthew 16 where he says, from that time on, Jesus began to show that his disciples that he must suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and be killed. Mark 9, he was teaching his disciples saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. Luke 9, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and be killed. In John 10, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Again, over 20 times in the Bible, Jesus foreshadows his own death. Really, Jesus spent the entire three years of his ministry getting his disciples ready for this moment. And they missed it. But here's where we have to be careful, right? Because we see this as, how could they possibly have missed this? But church, substance, friends, we miss this all the time. We miss it too, right? And just how Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray, I believe Jesus' word for us here right now in this moment is watch and pray. Because in the same way that Jesus prepared his disciples all those 2,000 years ago for the season they were entering into, I believe in the Bible we see a trail of breadcrumbs that Jesus leaves for us to get us ready for the seasons that we live in as well. Look at John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, in this world, you will have many troubles. Romans 12 says, rejoice in hope, but be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. So what we see here is the Bible actually talks in terms of trial and tension as certainty. You will be stretched. You will be tried. You will experience the tensions of life. And not only this, But it goes even deeper and presses in on us even more when it says in 1 Peter, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening. Or James 1, consider it joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So not only do we need to be looking for it, preparing for it, seeing it, man, somehow We have to learn to take joy in these seasons of life. And how do we do that, right? We look, prepare, prepare, watch, and pray. And then when it comes, we're not surprised. We actually can look at it, examine it, and say, man, I'm going to choose to take joy in this trial. How? 
Thanks for asking, that's our second point. So we watch and we pray and we look, and when it comes, we have two choices, right? We have two choices. We can either step out of our tension or we can choose by the grace of God to lean in and to step in and see what God is doing. Let's go back and look at Jesus in the garden again. I love that the Bible talks about how many times Jesus prays throughout the Gospels. I love that it shows us he's constantly going away on prayer retreats and praying with his disciples, but I, I love it even more when it tells us how Jesus prays and what he prays. Because look at this, right? He just has left his disciples for the first time. He comes back to pray, and he says, this is my Father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he goes back and finds his disciples sleeping, and he comes back again and again a second time. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink of it, your will be done. And again, a third time, comes back, and we see that he prays the exact same thing. This, you guys, I think this is so amazing. This is one of the most encouraging prayers in the Bible. Jesus, the eternal son of God, has a moment of tension. He says, I don't want to do this. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel like something I want to do, but Lord, God, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew exactly why he came to this earth. He knew exactly the plan God had for him, and yet still he felt that inner tension, that moment of tension. If there's any other way, make it happen, God. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that God doesn't thunder down from heaven with an answer. There's no audible voice. Right? There's nothing written in the sky. A prophet doesn't show up right, and say, well, I think here's what, Jesus is, here's what God is saying to you, Jesus. Right? There's none, none of that. And those things are all good things. He doesn't go on a prayer retreat and come back and say, okay, now I'm good. Again, those are all good things. We should do those things. But in that moment, Jesus had a choice. right? And we see that choice here. Looking at, starting Matthew 27, 47, the soldiers arrive, arrive. Judas betrays Jesus, and they move in to arrest him. And in that moment, Peter draws his sword, takes a wild swing, and cuts off a dude's ear, right? Who cuts off somebody's ear, by the way? Never mind. Um, Total wild swing. And look at what Jesus says. Look at this. This is crazy. He says, put your sword back in its place. Do you think that I can't appeal to my father right now, and at once he will send me more than 12 legions of angels? For your reference, that's approximately 72,000 angels. Blow the place up, right? But here's what he said. But how then should the word of God be fulfilled? This is such a cool moment of Jesus saying, no, I could step out of this right now if I wanted to. I have the authority and the ability to remove myself from this situation, but I know my mission. I know what I'm called to. I'm going to step in. Even if you look at this in the book of John, I love this picture in the book of John. The Roman guard says, we're looking for Jesus, and Jesus says, I am he. And in that moment, the entire Roman guard company falls down. They all hit the ground. That is power. And yet, Jesus allowed them to get back up, bind his arms, and take him away to his death. Jesus leaned in. So what does this mean for us? I want to quickly share kind of a, a little bit of my story um, I grew up in, in Iowa, as I mentioned before. Um, I know this will be shocking to many of you, but I had some success in the arena of basketball, um, which was a, a cool thing, got kind of a God-given gift from me and my family. And so played high school basketball, uh, did, did, had some success. And um, if I'm honest with you, I, I was raised in a wonderful Christian family. Both, both my parents raised me to love the Lord. I, I, I had a bunch of sin issues, um, pride and self-love, and I just loved the attention I would get from being successful. I, my, my identity and value were, were wrapped up in my ability to perform on the court, but God blessed me, got a, got a scholarship to play at a great Division II school here in Minnesota, uh, and played a, had a good freshman year. I mean, I, I was on the path that I had thought I, God had me on. If you would have asked me at that time, I said, this is God's will for my life. He wants me to play basketball for the rest of my life. I was, I was hoping to go pro, not NBA or anything, but overseas. Man, I, it, things were falling in place for me, right? Things were falling and lines were falling in pleasant places for me at that moment. And then after my freshman year of college, the wheels came off. So I woke up one morning. Um, and I, I, my shoulder was really swollen, and my arm was really, I didn't know what was going on, and after a bunch of tests, I landed in the Mayo Clinic for three weeks in intensive care. I had a blood clot in my shoulder. Now, kind of this crazy injury, the way my shoulder was put together, I, um, it's called thoracic outlet syndrome, and basically my muscle and my rib are pinching off a vein, and get this, every time I would do something, something over my head, like shoot a basketball or grab a rebound, over time, it was pinching off the vein in my shoulder, 
right? And slowly but surely, literally killing me from the inside out. You see that though? The very thing I thought was giving me life was actually killing me, literally, and I believe killing me spiritually. I had so much of my life and identity wrapped up in this thing called basketball. And for you, maybe you're like, basketball, who cares, man? But for you, what, what, it's something. It's something. We all have these idols of our heart that we attach our identity and our value to. So long story short, had um, reconstructive shoulder surgery. They actually cut out a rib. They severed a muscle. Um, spent, you know, three months learning how to use my right arm again, you know, t intense rehab. And I wish I could tell you that was my moment of clarity, but man, I kind of spiraled down into depression after that. And man, during those times, those dark times, I prayed so much to God, say, God, would you just heal me miraculously? Would you just let me play basketball again? Would you just, man, heal my shoulder, take me out of this, man, put me back where I was, please, please. And hear me, I believe God heals. I believe God delivers his people I believe that God pulls us up out of situations and rescues us. Man, at the same time, I thank God that he never rescued me in that moment. See, I thought I was supposed to be praying for God to remove these mountains in front of me that were circumstantial and physical. Hear me again, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for that, but, but God knew something that I didn't in that moment. If God would have simply pulled me out of that, healed me on the spot, put me back into playing basketball, nothing would have changed in my life. But it would have short-circuited the work that God wanted to do in me. The mountain I needed God to move was not out here, it was in here. Sometimes the mountain we need God to move is not outside of us, but it's inside of us. It's an internal mountain. So God knew something I didn't. As we walk through seasons of trial or tension, we can become obsessed with what's on the other side. When's it going to be over? God, why is this happening to me? God, would you just get me out of here? Instead of being obsessed with what's on the other side, what if we became obsessed with what God wants to do in us during our seasons of tension and trial and pain? What if God's will for your life was less about your circumstances and more about the person he's creating you to be right now? What if God is less concerned with where he's taking you and more concerned with who you're becoming in the process? Don't focus on the product at the expense of the process. Don't focus on the product at the expense of the process. I'm convinced that as often as we pray prayers of rescue, we need to be praying prayers of surrender and perseverance. We want rescue. God wants intimacy. We think the mountain that we need to move is, in, is out there, and it's in here, right? So God didn't heal me on the spot. Instead, he led me through a process of brokenness and soul-searching and inner healing that it would never have happened in my life without everything crashing down around me. I thank God for that season of my life, and I hated it, every moment of it. I thank God that he didn't answer my prayer and pull me out. He didn't miraculously change my circumstances and grant my body healing. Instead, he gave me what I call sustaining grace, which is every bit as miraculous as instantaneous, instantaneous healing. I'll say that again. Sustaining grace in seasons of trial and pain and brokenness is every bit as miraculous as instantaneous healing. Look what Romans 5 says, right? We rejoice in our tribulation because tribulation and tension produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. This is what God is doing. This is God's will for you and for me. He wants to work intimacy and endurance and character, and ultimately hope into our lives if we'll let him. If we resist the urge to step out and intentionally step in and lean in and say, God, do in me what you must. I want to know you. I want to have the hope that is unshakable. This is why I can have joy and tension because I know that through it, God is producing something in me that nothing in this world can take away. It's producing steadfastness and endurance and ultimately hope. Now, I do need to say one thing here, right? If you are currently suffering from an abusive or toxic situation, this message is not for you, okay? You need to get help and get out. Pastor Matt Keller talked a few weeks ago about the idea of the difference between being stretched and broken by God and being damaged by the, at the hands of the world. So let me encourage you, if you're not sure of the difference in your life right now, talk to someone today. If you're in one of our services, talk to a pastor, talk to our prayer team. If you're listening online, give us a call, shoot us an email. We would love to work, walk that discernment process. But if you are in an abusive or toxic situation, step out. Okay, 
So we look, we see, we become aware. We ask God, give us your eyes, that we lean, right? We get the most out of the seasons of tension. Let's finish the scene in the garden with love. The Roman guard has come. Peter takes out his sword, cuts off the ear. And this version of the story we read in Luke tells us that Jesus actually stops, bends down, picks up dude's ear, and puts it back on his head. Now, don't pass this by. I think we, we read this sometimes like, okay, that makes sense. Of course, Jesus, he's our healer. He does that. But think about it. Think about what must have been going on in his heart at that moment. He's, again, arrested, betrayed. He knows where he's going, torture and murder on the cross. And he stops and takes the moment to see the servant of the priest because he created that servant. He cares about that servant. He picked up that ear and put it back and healed him, changed that servant's life in his greatest moment of tension. That just, that's such a good example for us. He, Jesus pauses and turns aside. And as we face seasons of trials and tensions, the temptation will be to withdraw and to isolate and to go in. But the model that's portrayed here is one of in seasons of tension, we go outward. We sacrifice, we love, and we serve. And I'm thinking we, we have countless examples of this in our church. I think of my friend Tom. Tom has experienced multiple health issues these past couple months. Um, but man, Tom, every single Sunday morning, shows up at our downtown campus to move chairs. He spaces them out strategically and intentionally, and he makes sure that people coming into our downtown campus will have a great experience because they're not too close to the people, that they can see the stage. Tom cares about people. In one of the most tension-filled seasons of his life, Tom shows up every single Sunday. And then sometimes, to boot, Sunday night, he's serving in our kids' ministry all day long. Man, I think of some of our single mothers in our church. I can't begin to imagine the complexity of navigating life as a single mom. But man, I'm thinking of specific single moms right now who navigate life with their kids, multiple kids, and they show up to serve in our kids' ministry on Sunday morning. And no one would blame them if they just opted out of that and said, no, I'm just too busy and too stressed and too crazy. I would say, yes, absolutely. But they come and they show up and they serve. I think of our interns, right? How about our interns at Substance Church? Can we get a quick hand for them? We, I, uh, I know... Uh, um, I know my title is intern director, and so this, this may seem like a commercial internship, but I have the microphone and you don't. So um, really quickly, though, our interns, they're on a year-long journey of self-discovery and of learning what it means to be a leader, and they're working through personality differences and issues and just, man, getting healing, and they're this, this year of tension, and, man, and they show up on our campuses on Sunday, and they serve, they set up pipe and drape, they tear down pipe and drape, they set up pipe and drape, all the pipe and drape downtown, and kind of get an amen, you downtowners. Um, but man, they show up and they serve. And by the way, if you're interested in the internship, we have some great preview nights coming up for that, just saying. Um, but let me, let me come full circle with a story about my friend, Pastor Rick. So Pastor Rick, as many of you know, this past January experienced one of the, one of the craziest trials and tension-filled seasons of his life um, as he lost his beautiful wife, Crystal, in a tragic automobile accident. And there was a moment um, of Rick's life, I'm not even sure if he knows this until I told him this this past week, um, that he ministered to me in a way that I will never forget. And I remember this moment as, just as it was yesterday. Um, it was at Crystal's memorial service. And they, they, they came in and walked down the center and Rick with his kids and they sat in the front row and, man, and, and worship started. And I tell you what, um, as worship started, I didn't feel much like worshiping in that moment. Just to be super honest with you, it, 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 this felt unfair. Why did this have to happen? God, what are you doing? Like, what, seriously, God, like, really, God? And as that music started, the first two hands that shot up in the air in love and worship were Pastor Rick. And in that moment, Pastor Rick led us in worship. He put his hands in the air in an act of surrender and love for his Father in heaven. And man, I will never forget that. In one of the most tense, hard, difficult, broken moments of his life at his dear wife's funeral, he put his arms in the air. He said, God, I love you. I'm not going to go in with this. I'm going to go out with this, Right? Man, what a moment that was. So again, we'll come back to Eric and I, right? So maybe I might have left some of you thinking like, are he and Eric like there? Are they okay? Like are the ships, is this what's happening, right? We're fine. We're good. We have moments. So maybe if you ask us tomorrow, we'll say, yeah, marriage is really hard. Today it's good though. Um, so yay us. Um, I'm so thankful for my marriage, you guys. I'm not thankful for my marriage because it's easy. I'm thankful for it because it is the single greatest tool that God uses in my life to sharpen me to grind the rough edges of my personality off, and to give me incredible hope together for our future as a family. But it only is a tool if, by God's grace, I look and prepare myself for the tension prayerfully. 
And I take a step and I lean in and engage my wife in the tension that we have. Some of the fights we have, I like to call them intense fellowship, right? But we, we have it. It happens all the time, right? But, but I want to lean in and I want to be aware of it. And I want to choose to love and serve sacrificially for my wife, even though I don't feel like it in the moment, right? It's true for my marriage, and it's true for whatever situation you're in right now in your life. Whatever you are facing, choose to look at it through the lens of God's truth. In this world, you will have many troubles, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, right? Choose to lean in and ask God, God, form me and shape me and mold me through this, and choose to reach out and sacrificially love and serve those around you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that no matter what we're walking into or facing in our lives, that you are present. We don't have to invite you into every situation because you're already there. You're already working your will. You're already doing something in us when we don't see it. So God, we pray for eyes to see and ears to hear what you are saying and doing in our lives. God, we want to pray like your son Jesus prayed, not our will, but yours be done. So teach us to pray that with boldness and courage and joy. And church, I don't worry about this morning. If you want to just even say this little repeat after me prayer, I just want to encourage you to say this. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for creating me and for loving me. Help me to see my life with your eyes. Give me the sustaining grace to walk out your will for me and help me to love others in the same way you love me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And man, I love you, church. I love getting to do this with you right now. I'm going to invite our campus pastors to come on up and transition our service. Love you guys.